Hello, my name is Dr. Tio Bunwe. I'm the consultant urologist at Penang Adventist Hospital. Actually, it depends on uh, area. In our region where the climate is hot, it's actually quite common and we expect to see it in 1 out of 10 people in the population. For a person, the lifetime risk is up to 20% and the annual incidence of cases is about 1 to 2 cases for 1,000 people. There is a male preponderance where there are three times more male uh, patients than female and the peak incidence is usually in when they are in the 30 to 50 year old range and that is when they are the most productive. Yeah, so that this has a negative impact on economy and productivity. Unfortunate thing about stone disease is that once you treat it, there's still a recurrence rate of about 50% in five years. In 2015, 22.1 million cases of uh, urinary stone disease had been reported, with 16,100 deaths worldwide. Oh, there are many, many types of stones. They come in different size, shape, colours and consistencies. And that is what uh, makes the specialty uh, challenging to know how to treat each particular stone. Again, there is a lot of variety of presentation. Some patients don't know. So they go for a regular checkup and they might find blood in the urine or they might be they have gone for a routine medical checkup and did an ultrasound and then found a stone in the kidney usually or maybe in the bladder. Of course, some patients will present with pain, severe pain when a small stone which originates from the kidney drops down into the ureter which is a tube that connects the kidney to the bladder. Because the tube is so small, even a very tiny stone can cause a lot of problems and they will cause severe pain. I have had lady patients who say giving birth is easier than passing a stone and the pain radiates from the back and it comes to the front. It's very classical. And sometimes the patients can complain of pain when they pass urine. Sometimes also, patients may complain of passing blood in the urine and even some patients can't urinate or have difficulty in urination. Unfortunately, some patients will come late where the kidneys are badly affected and they come in kidney failure. Or even worse, there are patients who have blocked kidney and because of the blockage, there is a lot of uh, uh, remaining urine that becomes infected and becomes pus and patients become very, very ill and septic and they might end up in the ICU because of that. Well, the first thing when a patient comes is when we suspect the patient has a stone disease, we have to investigate. So first we do with simple things like a urine test. We look at the urine, see whether there are any blood, any infection, any crystals in the urine. And also then we do some blood tests. The blood test will tell us if the patient's kidney function is all right, any signs of infection. And also we look at the level of uh, the minerals in the blood. Once we have an uh, idea that probably the patient has stone, then the, the patient will require some form of imaging. So you, we can do a simple thing like an x-ray, but that tends not to be very sensitive. Slightly better, which is uh, easily available in most clinics, will be an ultrasound. But the most sensitive uh, investigation or Im Im imaging for stone disease is to actually a CT scan. CT scans are found to be 99% sen sensitive for picking up urinary stones. All right. And if we do have a stone, then we can analyze the stone to know the composite and then advise the patient accordingly if there's any way we can avoid having the stone in the future. So it depends on the presentation. If the patient presents acutely, which is quite common also when the patient presents with pain, of course the first thing we want to do is to relieve the pain. So we give painkillers, uh, either orally, but when they come in severe pain, the painkillers are usually given intravenously or intramuscularly. And sometimes the pain is so severe, patient feels like vomiting. So we give something to uh, re uh, prevent the vomiting. Usually also when the patients are ill, they tend to be dehydrated. So we give them IV fluids when they come. And if there are some patients who come with sepsis, we give them antibiotics. If they are not able to pee, then they might require a urinary catheter. And the most important thing is to stabilize the patient before we further investigate. Now, once we investigate and we realize that uh, 
what stone we are dealing with, then we have a many different types of treatment available. Now, like I said earlier, treatment depends on the type of stones, the position of the stone and the size of the stone. If, let's say, the stone is very small and it's on the way out from the kidney going to the bladder, once it's reached the bladder, most of the time, most of the times, the stone can be passed out. But sometimes it gets stuck there, you know. So if we can control the pain and the stone is quite small, then there's one option of having the patient take medication and have plenty of fluids and pass the stone out. But there are certain criteria for doing that. First is that the stone must be small enough, uh, the patient must have good enough kidney and the pain is under control and also there is no uh, infection involved. If any time along the period of waiting for the stone to pass out, anything happens like uh, infection or patient has pain, severe intractable pain, or we find that the patient's uh, kidney function is deteriorating, then we have to abandon this procedure and go for something active. If the patient comes with an obstructed kidney and is blocked by the stone, then we, there is the option of uh, putting up a stent. So a stent is a tube that looks like this. It's very, rather long, but it's very flexible. It's long because that's the distance between the kidney and the bladder. All right. So if the stone is stuck somewhere in between and it's too big to pass out and patient is in severe pain, the kidney is swollen and then maybe patient has some renal impairment, then we will do a uh, procedure where we put a scope into the bladder, find the opening going up to the kidney and pass a wire followed by this tube. This tube will bypass the stone and go up into the kidney so that the urine can come down. The, Obstruction will be relieved, so it's an infection, the infected urine will come out as well. At the same time, it will also distend the ureter so that subsequently we can do procedures for the patient to remove the stone. If the patient presents uh, with a stone in the kidney, all right, and it's not too big, usually we make a cut off about 20 millimeters. And if we find the stone is not too hard, we can tell that by doing a CT scan, we know the hardness of stone there. And if the stone is ideal, then a patient can go through a procedure called extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. In this procedure, this is done uh, as an outpatient, can be done as an outpatient under sedation. Uh, so there is no need for admission, there is no need for anesthesia. So it is quite uh, doable for many patients. Uh, so the patient will be laid on a uh, table operating table with a cut out on the side depending on which side is the side with the stone and then there will be a device that is pushed against the side of the patient and that device will transmit vibrations into the kidney focus on the stone and that vibration will break the stones into small pieces and the patient will pass the stone out so this procedure is actually quite acceptable because it doesn't require any anesthesia doesn't require any uh, admission but of course the Choosing the patient is the, the key to this. Not every patient can have this procedure. If, let's say, the stone is unable to break or we find before we even do anything that the stone is quite hard or in a location that is difficult to access and the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy is not ideal or is not acceptable to the patient because extracorporeal shockwave uh, can cause some discomfort. That's why the patient requires sedation then we can actually go into the kidney or the ureter, wherever the stone is, to get the stone. So in that way, we actually have the patient anesthetized and we go into the bladder through a scope. So there are no cutting involved. So it's all scope. We go through natural orifices, natural passages into the bladder. If it's a stone in the kidney, we go up the tube called the ureter to the kidney. Or we can go, if it's halfway between and it's stuck, we can go to where it's stuck along the ureter, that's the tube again, joining the kidney to the bladder. So halfway, halfway there, we find the stone and we can use an uh, energy device to break the stone. Uh, the energy device of my choice is laser. So this is actual laser uh, where light energy is used to break the stones into small pieces. Now, this device I have here is a flexible cystoscope. Uh, flexible urethroscope. So this flexible urethroscope is that thin, so it can go all and this long because it can go all the way from the outside into the bladder, up the ureter, into the kidney. Now the kidney has many, many 
uh, sections. It's like a big house with many rooms. So you can see the tip of the, the scope can be bent to go into different rooms, can be bent and twisted to go in different directions and find the stone. At the end of the scope is a camera and this is connected by this cable here to a TV monitor so we can analyze on so we can see where the stone is and how to deal with it. And there is a channel up here where we can insert water to irrigate so we can see what's going on and also pass a laser fiber through this. The laser fiber is very, very fine to go in all the way to the where the stone is and blast the stone. We can either blast the stone until it's very, very fine or if need to, until it's small enough, then we can pass this wire here. So this wire actually is not a wire, it's actually a basket. We can pass it through the scope and then at the end of it, there's a little basket at the end which we can open and then capture the stone, close it and then pull out the stone with the scope. So that is another way of dealing with stones. Now, sometimes you'll be surprised. Some patients present with a whole kidney full of stones and they have no symptoms except some ache or something like that. In the days before, people used to do big, big operations, big, big cuts to get to the kidney, split open the kidney, take out the stone and stitch back the kidney. As you can imagine, it's a big, big operation. It is very morbid, you know, patients suffer. Sometimes the kidneys don't do so well after a big operation. Now with the advancement of technology, we can actually go into the kidney through just a hole where we puncture through the guidance of imaging, either through X-ray or ultrasound. We find where the kidney is and then we poke inside the kidney to where the stone is and then make a hole slightly bigger so we dilate so we start off with just a needle and then from that needle we dilate make it bigger 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 until the size of almost a pen and then through that hole we put a sleeve so that's a hollow tube and through that hollow tube we can pass a scope inside to break the scone stone with energy source usually it's a, an, a stone breaker where we break the stones into tiny pieces and suck off the stone because they have many rooms, then sometimes we may have to use a flexible scope to go into different areas of the kidney to clear out all the stones. So because of this technology, the, the incision is only this big, about maybe 1.2 to 1.5 centimeters only on the skin and also in the kidney. Now finally, if there's a stone in the bladder, sometimes patients can have stone in the bladder because there are some obstruction, very commonly because they have a big prostate. So the prostate inhibits flow of the urine and the urine tends to stagnate and slowly become more dense and then a stone will form. So we can pass the scope just to the bladder and then through a laser, we can break the stone or we can have a device to crush the stone and take it out. So as you can see, there are a variety of stones. They come in different, different presentations and because of that, there are different, different treatments. And as I said before, because of our hot climate, we are more prone to urinary stone disease than somebody who's living in a colder climate. There are uh, genetic preponderance where we find stones in families, but many times the stones are uh, incidental, you know, in any, so anybody can get the stones. So my advice would be to drink more water, at least eight cups a day, which works up to be about two liters a day. Um, if you have any suspicion that you have a urinary stone, you know, then I would advise you to seek medical attention.